Mysterious Green Streaks Below Steve. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Elizabeth McDonald, Director of Citizen Science, NASA Space Science Education Consortium, Space Plasma Physicist for NASA Goddard, and founder of aurorasaurus.org. Welcome, Dr. McDonald. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course, give, give us a quick summary of your science background and tell us a little bit about aurorasaurus.org. Yeah, so I am a space physicist and I specialize in studying how the um, dynamic, beautiful aurora or northern lights are born and evolve. Um, and I've done that with a variety of techniques from rockets to satellite instruments during my career. And most recently, actually over the last several years, I've been working um, in this field uh, with the help of ordinary people, um, citizen scientists, extraordinary photographers around the world capturing the Northern Lights and uh, using that in concert with our more um, Cadillac observations from NASA uh, to better understand um, the aurora and some of the mysteries that, are, that we see in it. When it comes to Aurora Borealis, you and your helpers, helpers that you introduced us to a guy named Steve, fill us in. So Steve is actually the name of the unusual type of Aurora that citizen scientists helped to discover. And um, basically people, people were seeing something uh, at further south than the usual Aurora. Um, in this case, a bunch of people in Calgary uh, and working with them, um, we described, uh, they saw um, something that was purple and had little green fingers of light with it. It looks like a purple like contrail um, in, the, their photo, in their photographs. To the naked eye, it's very gray. It, it really looks like, a lot like a contrail. And they saw this overhead when the aurora was far to the north for them. The acronym STEVE means strong thermal uh, emission velocity enhancement, which is a really super strong flow. Um, and what we discovered when we looked at satellite observations as well is that it was something that we have seen by satellites before called a subauroral ion drift, um, but we never knew that it was visible. Um, so satellites would cut across it like north to south very quickly, and it would be this strong peak in flow in the upper atmosphere. Um, and it turns out that strong peak is actually causing this very weird purple light and this transient uh, different kind of green aurora as well. And now we have a new phenomenon, mysterious green streaks below Steve. Tell us about those. Yeah, so in the photographs um, of Steve, that came to light. Uh, Steve was kind of like at first um, photobombing the Milky Way. Like it was a long exposure photograph to get the Milky Way really gorgeous. Um, and Steve was cutting straight across it from east to west, which is where it usually shows up, actually where it always shows up. Um, when you look with a shorter exposure photographs, you can also see um, uh, green streaks that hang around for a number of seconds and then move and disappear. And that's something that was called, is called the picket fence along with Steve. Um, and so there's this purple feature that hangs out and is flowing rapidly across the sky for somewhere between um, on the order of half an hour to an hour and a half. And then at times these green picket fence features um, appear. And then citizen scientists took even shorter time exposure photographs. And they noticed that at the bottom of the picket fence, there were um, point-like features that kind of flow into these picket fence structures at the lowest altitude. And that's what the, this, that's the new mysterious green streaks at the bottom, at the lowest altitude edge of the picket fence. Um, we, this is the first report of such tiny little features in the aurora, like that is not how aurora is normally supposed to look. 
why is it important that we understand the physics behind auroras? Uh, so the physics behind auroras, it has to do with the larger field of space weather um, and the fact that the auroras could be impacting our technologies. Um, and they could be very broad, very strong. Um, the sun can, can do that. And we don't, we don't know when the sun could really um, go off and do something extreme. Um, and so we need to understand all the aspects of the system so that we can better safeguard our technologies. And even though this is happening uh, a lot further south than the usual aurora, it's very strong and very fast. And so there are space weather aspects of this that are um, still under active research as well. How important is citizen science in ground-based astronomy and physics? Oh, it's um, definitely very important. Uh, you know, with new sensors that people have, you could have the latest camera. Um, cameras that are commercial off the shelf technologies are now as good as what the professional really expensive cameras were like back in the eighties and even before then. So um, people take observations in a different way. They're very agile. They might have the latest photo, uh, sorry, camera. And so they can see uh, things that um, can see in a different way than traditional science observations, which are often set up for um, like a regular campaign and regular collection of data. And so um, when you look in a different way, you can find something different. And through citizen science, uh, those observations can be tagged, they can be submitted from all over the world. And so we can get a broader look at you know, it's not just one interesting photo, it's the fact that there are several and that they're um, uh, collected together and can be studied together that really helps us. Is there any way for those living in the mid latitudes to experience the magic of an aurora display? Yeah, so it's not so likely right now um, because the sun is at the minimum of its cycle, but the sun is coming out of solar minimum and will be um, active again. Uh, and at those times, it's more often than you think that you could actually see aurora that it crosses like the US Canadian border. So um, there's aurora chasers, there's people with better and better cameras. One thing that I'm really excited about is that in this next upcoming solar max, about 2024, 2025, um, people are gonna be able to capture Aurora on their cell phones. Uh, and I know this because I, I am not a photographer, but I actually went up to Yellowknife Canada um, this past March and captured Aurora on my cell phone very easily. And so, uh, there could be reports from all over of what the aurora is doing and the fact that it could be visible, you know, perhaps for a brief amount of time. But if you can get an alert on your uh, smartphone um, and from our system, our free alerts at Aurorasaurus, uh, more people can get out to see it. I tell you what, if you have a chance to observe an aurora, it's a magical experience for sure. Before you go, tell us a little bit about Hearts on the, in the Ice. Yeah, so Hearts in the Ice is an expedition um, that's just kicking off its second year um, way up in Svalbard, Norway, um, extremely far north. Uh, there are two women explorers who are going to spend a winter, a second winter, um, far, far from civilization in a trapper's hut without electricity and their mission is to raise awareness of climate change uh, in Svalbard. And they're doing this, um, in order to do this, they're doing citizen science the whole time. Um, and because they're overwintering, which is really historic, um, they're gonna be up there in the dark uh, for months and months, and they're gonna see a lot of aurora. So they are also taking um, citizen science observations with Aurorasaurus. Um, they did that last winter as well. They even supported, uh, helped to support a NASA um, sounding rocket that was launched from Norway. And they took photographs of the special types of aurora that um, 
occurred with that sounding rocket. And so it's very exciting. They're going back to the ice and um, just, you know, uh, wishing them well and um, excited to see what they will see uh, this next year as well. Dr. Elizabeth McDonald, Director of Citizen Science, NASA Space Science Education Consortium, Space Plasma Physicist for NASA Goddard and founder of aurorasaurus.org. If somebody wants to connect with you, Liz, maybe they want to find out more about auroras or the work that you do. Uh, how can they do that? Yeah, I would recommend them to uh, follow our project on Twitter, which is tweet Aurora at tweet Aurora. Um, and also check out our blog. We blog about space weather and um, you can find out more about the research and the science and all the fun stuff that we're doing. So that our blog is at blog.aurorasaurus.org. Always keeping us inspired. Thanks so much, Liz. Thank you. And find more of my interviews right here or on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube or at tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.